Good afternoon, good evening, dear friends, dear members of uh, the European Association of Israel Studies. Thank you for uh, joining us today on the occasion of the second open online forum focused on sexual and gender-based violence during uh, October 7. Uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> My name is uh, Marcela Menachem Zoufala and I serve on the board of uh, European Association of Israel Studies and work uh, at Charles University in Prague. Uh, the Open Online Forum is a new uh, project that the uh, European Association of Israel Studies uh, launched uh, as a response to the uh, Hamas terror attack uh, on October 7 in Israel. Uh, as most of you uh, are aware, uh, one day later was supposed to begin our annual conference um, that was uh, to be held at uh, Ben Gurion University of Negev. Uh, after 10 years in Europe uh, and uh, for the first time in Israel. The conference was uh, obviously cancelled uh, and uh, <clears throat> upon our uh, return to Europe, um, uh, we started to seek opportunities uh, on how to reach out to our uh, friends and uh, colleagues uh, in Israeli universities uh, and uh, academia, at least uh, virtually. The main idea behind this forum uh, is to uh, utilize the existing uh, uh, EIS network uh, to create a platform for uh, exchanges uh, of uh, unfiltered first-hand accounts, but also topics that have emerged uh, in the aftermath of the terror attack. Uh, on the first uh, open online forum, we asked um, our participants to share topics they consider the, the most important uh, at the moment. And it was uh, Professor uh, Sylvie fogiel bijou uh, who suggested talking about the sexual violence uh, on October 7. Based on uh, uh, Sylvie's recommendation, we decided to reach out uh, to our today's guest, uh, Professor Ruth Halperin Kadari. Um, welcome. And um, I would like to briefly uh, introduce uh, our uh, distinguished guest. Uh, Professor Ruth Halperin Kadari is an expert on uh, family and international uh, family law and international women's uh, rights and is the founding director of the Rachman Center for the Advancement of the Status of Women at Bar Ilan University um, in Israel, where she serves as a full professor. Uh, in December 2018, she completed three terms, 12 years, on the UN Committee on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDO, during which she also served twice as vice chair of the committee and as the first chair of the working group of inquiries. A graduate of Yale Law School, she is a renowned speaker in academic uh, as well as in professional forums. Uh, and has published uh, extensively in her areas of expertise, including a book on women in Israel that was published by University of Pennsylvania Press and co-edited second edition of the CEDO commentary by Oxford University Press. She's a recipient of uh, numerous research grants as well as international awards, uh, including the US State Department Women of Courage Award, and in 2018, she was named on a political's 100 most influential people in gender policy uh, <laughs> around the world. In June 2023, she was shortlisted for the Office of the High Commissioner for the Human Rights Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls. Welcome and thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, before we begin, I would like to clarify that we are recording only the first part of today's open online forum when we talk with Professor Ruth Halper in Kadari. Uh, all the participants will be able to post questions through key A function. In the second part of the event, we will stop uh, the recording and open the floor for everyone to share their insights and thoughts. The second part will be hosted by Dr. Olaf Glechner from Potsdam University, Moshe Mendelssohn Center uh, for European Jewish Studies. Uh, this is the moment also I would like to thank uh, um, dear friends and colleagues uh, 
from the European Association of Israel Studies, uh, President uh, Arthur Skorek and former President uh, uh, Joanna Diduch, uh, both from Jagiellonian University, where our association is currently based. Uh, so to sum up, I encourage everyone to submit questions already now, uh, and um, you can find this key A function uh, on the lower bar of your screen. Uh, after 20, 30 minutes, uh, Professor uh, uh, Halperin Kadari will begin to answer them. The final announcement is a trigger warning. The issues uh, we will discuss today are extremely difficult and all our viewers should consider and evaluate uh, their own emotional capacity. Uh, so uh, when we talk about what happened on October 7 in terms of sexual and gender-based violence, I would like to, to begin by uh, uh, quoting a recent article published uh, in New York Times. It was published just a week ago, and it's uh, called Screams Without Words how Hamas uh, weaponized sexual violence on October 7. Quoting, Israeli officials say that everywhere Hamas terrorists struck, the rave, the military bases along the Gaza border and the kibbutzim, they brutalized women. A two-month investigation by the Times uncovered painful new details establishing that the attacks against women were not isolated events, but part of a broader pattern of gender-based violence on October 7. Relying on video footage, photographs, GPS data from mobile phones and interviews with more than 100 people, including witnesses, medical personnel, soldiers, and rape counselors, the Times identified at least seven locations where Israeli women and girls appear to have been sexually assaulted or mutilated. Many of the accounts are difficult to bear and the visual evidence is disturbing to see. The Times viewed photographs of one woman's corpse that emergency responders discovered in the rubble of a besieged kibbutz with dozens of nails driven into her sides and groin. The Times also view a video provided by the Israeli military showing two dead Israeli soldiers at a base near Gaza who appear to have been shot directly in, a, in their vaginas. I will stop uh, this uh, very, very disturbing graphic descriptions now. And uh, I would like to ask you, Ruth, uh, how did you personally find out about this? So you, you're taking me back to October 7th, uh, to that, um, what we call the Black Saturday, uh, Black Shabbat. Um, I was actually not in Israel at that time. I was um, traveling in Europe on the way to the United States um, at the lecture tour discussing the judicial overhaul, <laughs> the regime overhaul, <laughs> with which we were so preoccupied um, just, just a year starting exactly today, a year ago. Um, and then um, came the news. We were on the way to the synagogue and um, I, I was with my son who studies now in Copenhagen and um, my daughter-in-law and they told me that um, the war started. Um, it was obviously very, very difficult to believe. And um, within a few hours started emerging uh, reports on unimaginable cruelty, uh, which was still very, very difficult to believe. It was really impossible to understand what was exactly going on. But the day after, after I realized that um, the terrorists did have many hours, everything within less than a day, but still many hours uninterrupted in so many locations, it was clear to me that a major part of what they engaged in was sexual violence. And it was clear to me, not just because of the scattered reports that surfaced on the internet, but also based on all those years of experience that I had on the CEDO committee, the committee on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, where we heard so many accounts from other conflict zones, in the world. And it is very, very hard to, 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 to acknowledge this, but sexual violence and weaponizing women and using rape as a tool of war 
is a constant feature of so many conflicts, armed conflicts around the world. And there was no reason that this time it would be different. What I did not have in mind and I could not have imagined is the degree of cruelty of that was involved in Hamas using weapon, women as a weapon of war and using w rape as a weapon of war. The degree of cruelty, the brutality, the extent, the mutilation that was also such a strong feature of their violence, the atrocities, that I could not have imagined. But um, but within a few days, um, we started organizing a number of us who are um, activists in this area of um, prevention and combating sexual violence and gender-based violence um, uh, in Israel. We started um, organizing, first of all, to approach um, the international human rights community, and then also to approach the Israeli authorities to... Um, to, to make them realize that this should be a major part of the investigation and of the services provisions and um, you know to 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 adapt to the new reality which Israel did not encounter before of of sexual violence and gender atrocities as as a part of a terror of a terror attack. Thank you. Um, you, uh, in, I went, uh, I went uh, through all your media appearances uh, and uh, podcasts since uh, since October seven. Um, I must say that uh, you are uh, engaging in, uh, in a great work, uh, and uh, like uh, it's it it must be uh, like uh, very difficult for you personally to. Uh, to run this raising awareness campaign, um, I found also your uh, your podcast uh, from November thirteen uh, in conversation uh, uh, with uh, Haaretz Weekly host Alison Kaplan Sommer, and uh, you said uh, you feel completely betrayed by the international women's rights organizations uh, with whom you worked for years. Uh, I'm quoting for the failure to condemn or even recognize uh, the rape, kidnapping, and other atrocities committed by Hamas terrorists against Israeli citizens on October 7. Could you walk us through that and tell us how it's evolved since then? So this is uh, really a very, very difficult part of October 7th and its uh, aftermath. As, as I said, um, within two days, um, already on the Monday and the Tuesday, after that Saturday, um, I, together with uh, a colleague, a um, uh, former professor from uh, Hebrew University, Francis Radai, we sent letters to a number of UN entities. First of all, that committee, the CEDAW committee in which Francis also served in the 90s, and then I uh, served uh, uh, after that um, for, for 12 years. Um, so we wrote to them, we wrote to the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, to the Special Rapporteur on Enforced Disappearances, to the Children's Rights Committee, um, to UN Women, of course, and to a number of other entities. And we recounted what was known then and it was mainly relying on media reports, but there was undoubtedly enough to, to, raise, to raise the concern, to raise the alarm that this took place, that gender violence and gender atrocities were part of Hamas attack. And we asked them to acknowledge that and to condemn Hamas. And then started, um, and, and also by the end of that week, we already had um, hundreds of signatures, maybe some of the uh, members of the Israel Studies Association were also 
um, part of those uh, list of uh, signatures, um, long list of law professors, international law professors and gender and law professors uh, joining in the urgent appeal to the UN and all those UN bodies to recognize and to condemn uh, Hamas. Um, and and we sent we sent them. Um, and and as I said, what started was um, strong silence, deafening silence on the side of uh, practically all these bodies until um, early December. Um, and I think that what the the most disappointing, um, reaction came from the CEDAW committee. And uh, that was really most devastating for me because, because I know, I still know many of the people there. They were colleagues of mine. I know how it works. They were in session. Their session started on October 9th. So they had the opportunity to discuss and to talk about it and to, to check and, and maybe to ask more questions. And the statement that they issued at the end of the session after three weeks was so disgracing, was disgraceful, so shameful. It didn't even mention October 7. It didn't mention Hamas. It didn't mention Israel. It just said something very vague and abstract about the cause of peace is the cause of women. Um, this, this was really, th this is where I really felt uh, betrayed. Um, and then UN Women, um, they issued a number of statements and and um, and said a few things. And Sima Bauhaus, the Director General, um, gave uh, a number of speeches. Also on October twenty fifth, which is the anniversary for the adoption of Security Council Resolution Number thirteen twenty five, and in all of them, on October twenty fifth, she didn't mention October seven. She didn't mention Israel and Hamas and the gender atrocities that Hamas com committed, which was you know, the most recent example of, of what Security Council Resolution 1325 is aiming to prevent. No mention of that. And in many of their statements and other um, entity statements, there was this symmetry between October 7th and Gaza and the Israel um, uh, uh, onslaught on on Gaza as uh, the, the 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 defensive um, operation in in Gaza in response to um, to October uh, to October seven, but no mention of sexual violence in none of these none of these uh, statements. Um, now, I am aware that some people could say that since there was no, and there still is, no actual survivor of the attacks of the of the rapes who is who is willing and and and, and able to speak up, mostly because of the horrific reason that most of them were simply murdered immediately after they were assaulted and those who survived were taken hostage. So there is no surviving um, uh, victim to speak, to give a first hand um, uh, testimony. And in that sense, this is different from other um, other um, uh, instances where um, sexual violence was part of the war, for example, in Bosnia or Rwanda or 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 even now uh, Ukraine. However, as as we claimed throughout these weeks, there was enough other evidence. There was enough, there were already quite early on, there was one eyewitness survivor who, who testified of what she saw in real time. And then there was all those footage, photographs of the first responders who, um, who, who, who testified and who had these photographs of 
all the, the bodies that they um, had found in many locations in, in the scene of the of the music festival and in the um, army bases and in the and the kibbutzim, and there was the what the um, uh, people who uh, who took care uh, who worked at the morgue um, testified. So there was enough evidence to at least acknowledge that this that there are these claims, that there are these concerns and that they must be investigated and that apparently Hamas engaged in sexual violence and there is no excuse to sexual violence and sexual violence is not just a war crime, but it is also um, amounting, it could amount to crimes against humanity. There was enough to, to require that this would be acknowledged. Um, and, and it was not. In the first um, eight weeks, um, there was no, no such uh, acknowledgement. Um, and then at some point, the, um, the, the, the attitude started to change, but very slowly, very gradually. And I believe that it is changing now very much thanks to the conventional media, to the traditional media. Um, the New York Times, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, article that you quoted is just the last one in a line of media reports. And I stress the, the, the fact that we're talking about traditional media, um, the, 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 the Guardian, the Washington Post, um, um, El Magazine in, in France, um, uh, the, um, 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 no, not Springer, uh, the, the Zeit, oh, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm confusing between a few, um, media outlets, but anyway, all these leading, um, international, um, media, media reports, um, they picked up on the subject and um, many of us, um, there were a couple of weeks where I think I I, I gave um, maybe 40 or 50 uh, interviews and, and of course I'm not the only one. Um, there are many others uh, engaging in this, um, in this, in this kind of uh, work. Um, and um, this started influencing um, the international human rights um, uh, community. Um, and um, uh, I, I think that um, also thanks to the event that took place in the UN um, in New York, um, and uh, I uh, traveled to the UN in Geneva um, to give a briefing to the to the ambassadors community uh, there and to meet with the High Commissioner uh, on Human Rights. Um, at at the end of um, at the end of November, so all these steps um, gradually and slowly um, started um, shifting the attitude. And maybe for our um, viewers who are may not be that familiar with uh, with the UN uh, bodies, uh, why 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 do you think that the UN bodies did not react? Is it uh, is it common in such a situation, or how do you interpret it? After let's say twelve years, also you have uh, first first hand experience uh, from from this platform. Yeah, a number of reasons, and um, I know that um, the conventional wisdom, at least among these Israelis, um, is to simply say this is anti-Semitism. And I'm not ruling this out. And I do agree that anti-Semitism is also part of it, but it's not the only part. Um, part of the reason, as I said, is that in, in, in um, unlike other instances, we have no firsthand account of the surviving, of, of surviving victims. We also do not have the hardcore forensic evidence due to the fact that 
in the first few days on October 7 and 8 and 9, the, um, the, 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 it was still a battlefield. Though all those parts in the southern part of Israel, there the were the, the rescue efforts and the, the, the collection of the bodies, it all took place under fire. And the Israeli authorities were not prepared for such a huge amount of bodies that were piled one on top of the other. The morgue was not equipped for that. The very first priority was to simply identify the casualties, the, 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 the dead. There were thousands of family members waiting to hear whether their loved ones survived or were murdered or were taken hostage. In those first few days, we didn't even know how many people were taken hostage uh, into Gaza. So the question of identification, and this was also a very, very difficult task because so many of the bodies, so many of the victims were burnt. Some were burnt alive. So the task of identification was extremely excruciating and when you when you hear the testimonies of those people who worked there in the task of identification, it, it's it's clear that this was hell on earth, simply hell, what they describe. So identification and bringing to burial, according to Jewish tradition. So unfortunately, no forensic tests were performed on the bodies and no photographs were taken of the full of the full um um the full bodies of the of those who were uh, murdered only the upper part of the, the head the face for identification purposes so again Going back to um, to to the demands from the the world, we have to bear in mind that these two facts they are not meaningless. They are not meaningless. However, if I do want to compare, and I did compare the reaction of UN women to October seven with the most recent example of a similar, a similar um, occurrence, a similar episode in Ukraine. And I'm not talking about the invasion itself. I'm talking about the massacre in Bucha. This is the comparable event because in both these instances, there was an outbreak of extreme degree of violence and of cruelty in a relatively short span of time, which left chaos, which left a lot of chaos and unclarity and difficulty in sorting out what happened, what did not happen. And UN women reacted immediately. Within a days, they issued statements and they called for investigation and they recognize the fact that apparently there was sexual vi sexual violence uh, part of the massacre etc cetera, etc cetera. and this did not happen in the case of of Israel and Hamas on October 7 and that's where the double standard towards Israel comes in Israel had Israel's history with the UN is a long history of double standard where Israel is um, always uh, judged on a much, much higher standard than other um, countries. And when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Palestinians are um, always viewed as the ultimate victims and Israel as the ultimate aggressor and oppressor. And here, 
for for one day the equation completely flipped and the roles changed and then within two days went back because within two days Israel started its defensive attack in reaction on Gaza and since then what the world um, has seen is ongoing pictures um, reports of devastation that has taken place and still is taking place in Gaza. And of course, I'm not denying for a moment the, the sufferings and the, and, and, and the fact that so many, so many people in Gaza, innocent civilians, including women and many, many children, are paying the highest uh, price uh, for what for what Hamas did, but but this led the those UN entities to fall immediately into that pattern of of symmetry and of finding it very very hard to uh, to put Israel in the position of the of the victim and to recognize that um, uh, at this at this point at this time. Hamas um, uh, was the, um, the 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 attacker and committed crimes against humanity, and and Israel was the was the the victim. Thank you so much um, for uh, this uh, very detailed uh, explanation, and uh, also for bringing up the say comparison from uh, from the Ukraine. Um, it's um, it's called uh, what Hamas did. Uh, it's called uh, the best documented uh, human rights atrocity in history. So it's a uh, it's somehow let's say paradox that uh, there is not uh, enough uh, so called uh, hard uh, hard evidences, forensic evidences, uh, because the bodies were were buried mostly, and uh, on the, at the same time we have uh, or we had. Uh, plenty of uh, of evidences provided uh, by uh, by Hamas uh, attackers themselves that they got uh, body cameras and they were they were streaming they filmed their uh, their actions and they were they were streaming it uh, on the on the social media and they broadcasted it also to the to the families of of the victims uh, through their own through their own smartphones usually so uh, is is not uh, is not such evidence enough for issuing uh, one simple statement because uh, i don't know it's um, it's a little bit um, i understand that of course uh, there needs to be carried very careful investigation but at the same time when we have the evidence provided by the perpetrators themselves so it may be it may be a little bit like a changing the the situation or this the problem instance. is the problem is that we currently do not have those exact videos or footage which were apparently broadcasted in real time on the saturday and and are probably stored or were stored in um in in the body cameras of Hamas we do not we i mean we the authorities the police the idf um um the 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 secret services had not yet found um footage that depicts sexual assault act of rape we do have tens of thousands of digital files that need to be sorted out and it will take time. Now, I, I did see uh, within the um, one of the IDF intelligence units, I did see footage from Hamas um, body cameras um, with indications of, of the sexual assaults. But again, no, no, um, uh, uh, no video that actually depicts an act of 
of uh, of of rape um they they will come they will come i have no doubt that they will be found and um as as the investigation continues um but 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 it it, it is somewhat a paradox that the most recorded um sexual crime in in war history um is now being the most denied and um and and we know the role of uh, social media here um Hamas are very good in engaging in this uh, denial campaign and they're being assisted um by 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 Russia and by China that's another New York Times investigation that um showed how they actually manipulate and uh, spread the the fake and the denial um so it's 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 not it's not an easy battle to to fight I would like to encourage everyone uh, who can see us and hear us to to ask the questions we have uh, professor Halperin Kadari with us uh, another 14 minutes so uh, please uh, Use use our time wisely. Um, maybe uh, one, uh, let's say, uh, last uh, consideration from my side. Uh, when I was discussing this uh, this interview uh, with uh, with some of my colleagues, uh, I was also asked uh, why why this recognition uh, by the UN by the international community. Is, uh, is so important. I could uh, only think about the uh, Elie Wiesel quote, uh, what hurts the victim the most is not the cruelty of the oppressor, but the silence of the bystander. But perhaps you you would like to add something to it. Thank you. Thank you for, for quoting uh, Elie Wiesel. I think this is the most appropriate um, answer um and and i want to stress that um the work that i'm doing and i think many of my colleagues is not as kind of um it's not on behalf of israel definitely not on behalf of israel's government when when i was at the un and when i spoke with the high commissioner on human rights i said that i'm coming as an independent expert which was my role when I was on CEDA, and I'm coming in the name of, of all humanity, of all human rights defenders, and not necessarily as an Israeli, because if the world stays silent in, in, in the face of such atrocities, such un, un in my view, undeniable, atrocities and no possible unjustified atrocities and stays silent and not recognize it, it, it gives legitimation to the next terrorist groups. Um, it gives legitimation to Hamas. And they said very clearly that October 7th was just at the beginning and they will engage in more and more and million October 7th possibly not just against Israel, possibly against others who are standing in their way to realize their, um, their destructive um, uh, as aspirations. Um, the, 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 there, are clear, there are clear principles in human rights law, in international human rights law, in humanitarian law. And this occurrence violated all these principles what are these bodies standing for if not to defend these principles, to, to realize them? Their role is to, to protect and to promote and to prevent violations of human rights and to pro promote human rights for all people, for all women. And, and staying silent is betraying the whole human rights system, is not just betraying betraying us. It is undermining the whole reason, the whole raison d'etre of, of, this, of this system. Um, so that, 
so that's that's the importance of this um, recognition. And my my aim is that October seventh will go down in history side by side together with Bosnia and with Rwanda and with Congo and DRC and the Yazidis and Ukraine, that whenever there is talk and discussion of using rape as a weapon of war and weaponizing women, these places in the southern part of Israel, Kfar, Kfar, Kfar Aza and Reim and, and Nir Oz and Be'eri, these places will be mentioned together with with those those countries that I that I mentioned um, uh, before. And for that, we need the recognition and we need the investigation and we need a report that will put an end to all the denial. Thank you so much for this clarification. And uh, I see we have uh, we have a few questions. Uh, are you able to see them or uh, uh, I will read them out uh, okay. loud? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing them. I'm seeing them now. Um, I will read it out loud because I'm not sure if also uh, our viewers uh, of the recordings will be able to see it. So it would be interesting to have a comment on the fact that it took CDAF and another international organizations dealing with women's rights so long before reacting to these crimes. I believe this is, we, we quite cover it widely. Yes, covered it, yeah. Mm -hmm. it was probably at the beginning. And here, uh, another question. Uh, how do Professor Halperin Kadari suggest we go from here in highlighting this issue to a wider audience? How to fight this double standard? I think maybe we can take this question and the next one together. Next. Okay. Um, the next is, do you believe there is a chance that in the future UN bodies will more strongly condemn and acknowledge the Hamas war crimes? Yeah. So so I'll take them together because um, I think I'll, I'll start with the second one. Um, yes, I do believe, and as I already um, indicated, um, the attitude is changing. And um, there already are a number of UN entities. I think first and foremost among them is the special representative of the Secretary General on sexual violence in conflict. And um, this, this uh, position, the name of the special representative is uh, Pramela Patton. Um, she was also a former member of the CEDAW committee and uh, we are, um, uh, we, we, we are colleagues and we worked um, together very well uh, when we both served on the CEDAW committee. And now she serves as the role which is specifically geared to this issue of sexual violence in times of war and in areas of conflict. And she's the one who um, on October 8 issued uh, a first statement, a very, very strong one. Um, condemning uh, Hamas, recognizing that sexual violence was part of the Hamas attack, talking about the collective trauma that is resulting from being exposed to these uh, kind of uh, atrocities. Um, and she accepted an invitation from the Israeli government to um, conduct um, a, a visit which will also, in fact, entail investigation um, into uh, Hamas, um, into into uh, uh, Hamas actions, into Hamas attack on October seventh. She also addressed addressed, and um, on more than one occasion, um, the issue of the hostages, especially primarily the female hostages, acknowledging the reports of those hostages that returned from. Uh, Gaza uh, reporting on the ongoing sexual violence that still takes place um, in in captivity, and she um, uh, so she connected all these um, issues issues uh, together, um, and I believe that once she comes 
and engages in this investigation together with her team of, of experts, um, I believe it will have a very, very strong um, uh, um, strong uh, effect in um, combating this uh, denial and in um, um, affecting um, uh, and, and um, influencing uh, all other UN entities to uh, recognize and to acknowledge. And I, I, if uh, the, the result of such, um, of such uh, an investigation uh, will be a report that the Secretary General will bring to the Security Council and to the General uh, Assembly. And, and again, I think that this um, could be a real game changer in terms of the attitude of, of, all, of all other uh, countries as well. Um, and so um, uh, I, I think that um, in, in asking um, um, in asking also how to highlight uh, this this issue um, is is um, even before such a visit takes place um, to to um, uh, many of us, you know, are 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 active in uh, social media and um, talk in many forums. So it is the responsibility of each and every one to share these stories, to share, for example, the New York article and and others. There was there was a Wall Street Journal article right after that, which is also a uh, very very uh, comprehensive and um, and and gives. Um, accounts of the of the realities of what people really went through on October 7th. Um, there is renewed interest from the media. So look for the new media reports on this uh, issue and um, and and stand by for this um, uh, investigation, which I have reasons to hope that it will take place um, very, very soon. So stand by to that and then to also uh, spread it and and share it um, and and um, convene conferences and talk about it, write about it. Um, there's there's a lot that uh, that can be done. Wonderful. Maybe you could um, submit a panel to our uh, next conference in Prague in July 2024. And uh, it, yes, it you're reminding me. I noted it in my. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I, I don't have I don't have time to. <laughs> but yes, I think the deadline is tomorrow or next week. Oh, the, <clears throat> it it will be maybe postponed, but uh, I will not reveal any details. Do, do we have time for another question? There is um, there yes, is one, uh, more one, one last time. Uh, yeah. Time. Keeping in mind all the technical challenges that you've mentioned, how long can the Israeli investigation into the sex crimes take? And to what extent can it succeed in giving a detailed picture of the atrocities? So very quickly, we have to distinguish between the criminal investigation that Israeli police is now conducting, and it's the most complex and challenging and um, and the, will be the longest um, criminal investigation in Israel's history. We have to distinguish between that. That is criminal proceedings bringing to justice, um, indicting, and hopefully um, convicting individual Hamas terrorists, perpetrators of these crimes. That's one issue. And the standard of evidence uh, uh, needed for that is very high. It's a standard of beyond all reasonable doubt in criminal law. The threshold is very high. And frankly speaking, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that it will be possible for the Israeli police to meet this standard. But what I'm talking in terms of the historical memory, the historical collective memory, as I said, how October 7 will go down in history, that's a different issue. For purposes of investigation, such as the one that will be conduct conducted by the special representative of the Secretary General, the threshold is lower. And already at this point, 
we have more than enough, just like we saw on the um, on the uh, investigation on the story uh, that was published by uh, the New York Times. So these technical difficulties that are mentioned, they exist, but we can definitely, definitely over overcome them. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you also. I would like to conclude with this, that uh, you, you mentioned now uh, two very important topics. Uh, first is uh, hostages, that um, it's uh, it's very, very uh, crucial issue. And uh, we didn't have <clears throat> enough time to talk about it. Uh, so uh, it is it is also quite uh, um, we plan uh, one of our next uh, open online forum to dedicate uh, to to these topics and uh, also uh, uh, the the ongoing war uh, in uh, in Gaza that uh, that will be uh, also one of our uh, future um, fu future issues of uh, of this uh, of this session. Thank you so much for being with us thank today. You. And thank you for thank everything you. that you are doing. Thank we you. very much appreciate it. So we'll, we, with wishes for better times to come. Hopefully. Bye. -bye. Bye.